This Missoula, Montana fire lab is the only one of its kind in the U.S. They work every day to answer seemingly simple questions like, how does fire spread? That's one they thought they already knew. We started to realize that a lot of the basics that we thought were the foundation of, of fire behavior science were, in fact, quite wrong. Uh, not just a little wrong, but exactly wrong. Not just wrong, counterintuitive. That's, I would say, the theme for most of our, our research here is that we initially use intuition about fire and to, to start experiments and design them. But often what we find is results that are exactly the opposite of what we thought we were going to find. Mark Finney's team disproved the entire theory about how fire spreads about a decade ago. Scientists thought flames spread through radiation, the same energy transfer that allows you to feel warmth from the sun. Instead, they found it was convection, basically flame contact. Convection is a very, very efficient process of heating fuel particles, especially if they're very small. Here's why that matters. Many of the fuel particles in wildland fires are small. Think pine needles, twigs, grasses. There's a little trough right here. The revelation led to an even simpler question. Why is fire shaped the way it is with peaks and troughs? No one had ever figured out what those were, whether they were functionally meaningful for wildland fire, or there's just some some something that was you know superfluous to the whole process. Well, it turns out that those are the reason that fire spreads. These simulated fuels allow Finney's team to burn the same fire over and over and take high-speed video. That's when they notice that pattern in the structure. But it's the cold air coming down counterintuitively to replace the rising gases going up that is actually pushing flames down into the bed and touching, making those flames touch the fuel particles out ahead of the fire. The more fuel in the forest, the larger the flames. And it's one part of why firefighters are seeing such a dramatic change on the lines. All that stuff is sitting there waiting to be burned, and it has to be removed, and it will be one way or another. I would categorize the difference as radical. If you took 1995 firefighter Sean Borgen to drop that same firefighter just overnight into today's environment would be a, a head spin. Right, because things move way more, way more quickly. There are way more hazards on the landscape. So how is fire behavior changing? Well, that's why we came to this lab to find out. But as we learned ourselves, we were asking the wrong question. Even though people are seeing fire behavior that surprises them, the physics of fire behavior hasn't changed. It's never changed. Basically, fire is doing what it's expected to. What is different? The conditions. Climate change combined with overgrown, dense fuels, a recipe for disaster. The percentage of fires that are getting away and going from that initial attack mode to extended attack, large fire scenario, that is happening faster and with a higher frequency than we ever had. This little flame is the same temperature as the biggest crown fire you've ever seen. Finney says the solution is again counterintuitive, more fire. The science shows us pretty clearly what we need to do. And often that is disappointing uh, to people because they don't want to see that fire is the solution. They just inherently don't understand it and it scares them. And if, if you say we need more fire in the landscape, well, they say, well, that means more smoke and that means more impact to me. But it's not like we have a smoke-free environment at, right now. We would just have ownership of that smoke, and we'd take responsibility for it as part of our, our necessary management approach. That's been termed and widely discussed in the, in the science community as the fire paradox. It's this thing that can threaten us. Yet, if we don't allow it to exist, it threatens us more. That's why you'll see more planned fire in the Forest Service's new wildfire crisis strategy. In many cases, it will take thinning the trees before burning to prevent a disaster. The plan includes treating more than 50 million acres across the U.S., and it will take maintenance. We have to mow our grass. You'll mow it once and then, you know, 20 years later, do it again. I mean, it's, it's, it's constant maintenance. After decades of research, there are two messages Finney wishes he could get through to people. First, fire is our ally. Second, we don't have a choice about fire. Every year we prove we do not have the power to choose not to have it. The only power we have is when to have it and what kind to have. And that's it. And when you realize that those are your only real choices, why wouldn't you choose to have beneficial kinds of fires that sustain rather than destroy the forest?